Next speakers, uh, Jens, Bea, and Natalie Spisa, Spicer yeah, from Lavrio Solutions are going to talk to us about being a beginner data scientist um, and some advice and pointers. I'm very excited. Please welcome Jens and Natalie. Thank you um, for coming um, for this little talk we are giving uh, about data science projects for beginners. My name is Natalie. I'm Jens. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit about our experiences that we did uh, when we started as data scientists. And um, yeah, especially we will focus on the project uh, part in the title. So it's more about um, if you're if you are a data scientist and you're going to the client and are having the first projects. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit also some political stuff and, um, yeah, I hope you will enjoy it. <laughs> so, um, at first, what do you think about when you want to start a data science project? When uh, we thought about it, we, um, we came from uh, science, so um, we thought, um, where to start, so we came across uh, Kaggle, and if you're a real beginner, this is like really one of the best things to do. There are a lot of kernels, there's a lot of stuff to learn, it's um, just an amazing um, yeah, community that's going on there. So um, we started there, and then you, um, get, you dive into this um, whole Kaggle world, and then you get the, um, the idea that, it should, that the data looks always perfectly, um, that it's always this nice tables, that it's always about finding the best algorithm, uh, tuning the best, um, tuning the parameters so you will be uh, like 0 0.0001 better than the person before you in the leadership and stuff like that. So you get, um, yeah, you, you get the feeling that it's always about getting the best prediction that's um, closest to reality. But then um, real world kicks in <laughs> if you try um, to do a real project. Yeah, so what happened to us was when we, um, we started out as data science consultants, basically. So we go to external clients and have their projects. Um, this, this is almost all is our experiences from real projects. Um, but I think it's also transferable from what we know from colleagues. If you start in a big company um, as a data scientist, you basically also start as an internal consultant. So when we talk about clients, you can also think about internal clients. And where it really started for us was, was basically um, getting, um, yeah, getting started with such a project. So we needed to find the relevant people. We needed to get all the relevant people in the room to get access to the relevant data. And especially what we also needed was to get all the relevant people into the room from the beginning on. That happened to us once, that the, um, one of the very important persons wasn't there for the first day of the workshop. So he came there in then, and we had to basically start over again because he had crucial information. So um, what we really want to stress is basically, if you are the data scientist and you want to bring this kind of work um, into a company or to your client, you also need to focus on the people and becoming and staying the organizer of the workshop. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is like one, um, the, our first uh, project that we did, and um, this the, was the first um, the ad agenda we did there. So it's really into time boxes, and it's set, and um, every single minute is planned. And you, um, this is what, yeah, what I think is really good if you are having. Um, if you're doing a workshop with clients to be really prepared for everything. And especially what we want to stress um, is uh, the, the coffee breaks. It seems to be um, quite yeah, silly, but it isn't. It actually really, um, it has a lot of worth to spend time with the people you are working with, um, not just in this um, uh, data related talks, but also on just talking about, oh, this is a nice cake, I don't know, I like it a lot, and then you get um, a different um, yeah, um, way with the people to interact and also um, get to know them in a different way, 
and sometimes um, it's really uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we will come back to the coffee breaks later on because that was actually crucial in one of our projects to have a coffee break. Um, so what we want to talk to you about is basically a real project. Since we are on some NDAs, um, we couldn't take the data from our clients, but uh, we had a project for our own, um, which got smiled upon by some of our colleagues. Uh, we, are, we had the chance to be exhibitors at the CEBIT, which is a big fair here in uh, Germany. And for that, we wanted to have something to show. So everyone told us chocolate is nice to have on the CBIT because otherwise no one comes by your booth. So we wanted to combine chocolate and machine learning. And that's basically this project and what we did there translates to our client projects that we did. And we want to show you how in the next few minutes. Yeah, so at first, um, if you start a workshop, it's really important to get into the mood of openness, open-mindedness, so um, you try to open the space for ideas. Um, at first, w and when we um, start, we go to the client and um, show them a little project from maybe from Kaggle, um, some really easy things like house prices or anything, so everybody can understand what, what it's about, so um, that they will be triggered how how machine learning can work, how um, good are the predictions sometimes if you're doing like a house prices predictions and how far are they away from um, reality and it's pretty cool so that they get the idea and try to, um, that they will get um, ideas on their own about their own, uh, um, about their own data. So um, this is what you try to bring, like this inspirational um, mood. Um, yeah, and the other thing uh, that we heard uh, earlier this morning is uh, that show that data science is not magic. Um, yeah, when we, when we started, like all the people were like, yeah, here we have this SQL dump. Um, you can take this and bring it to um, information, right? This is how it works. And they're like, mm, not really. <laughs> we really have to talk about what's in the data. What are your goals? What do you really want to achieve with, um, with the machine learning? Do you want to predict something? Um, what, what is the consequence out of those predictions? So it's, um, yeah, it's important to make sure um, the, your, your clients get that it's not real magic. <laughs> it's Sort of magic, but not real. <laughs> so yeah, so we need to open the space for the ideas of your client. And there's something all else we want to um, share with you. We heard from a lot of colleagues too. Um, don't expect your client to speak with one voice after that they've seen your presentation. And even if you work for the company and you're presenting it to your internal clients, uh, you also have the possibility, um, or it's a quite high probability that there are people in the room who don't know each other, even though they are concerned with the same topic, and they will discuss about this stuff uh, also in front of you, but also that's what coffee breaks are for. Um, tell them to get their um, discussions into the coffee break and get to one voice. But yeah, um, when you start as a data scientist, I think you, uh, or we at least, and many of our colleagues, started out with the expectation that the client would know what he wants. That's not true. Um, you have to help them there a lot. And you have to focus on relevant information. Um, people who are not concerned with data science tend to um, discuss a lot of special cases and tell you, like, it's not possible to predict that because once in a blue moon there's this one special case and it's completely, um, yeah, you're dealing in statistics. Um, so try to sift through that, what's really important from that. You have to keep it in mind, obviously. Special cases are really interesting, but um, in the beginning, you have to focus on what do you want to do with the whole data set. Um, so we're coming back um, every, yeah, every two slides to this real project that we did, and it's a, like a translation for a project you might have with a client. So uh, when we opened up our private little spaces, um, we had a lot of ideas how to uh, combine machine learning and chocolate, because that's apparently a really important thing to do at a fair, chocolate. So. Um, we thought about um, yeah, doing, showing some stuff we did on Kaggle, like predictive maintenance, where you can get a lot of open data from and predict, yeah, some predictive maintenance stuff, yeah, you know that. So, um, but it wasn't really feasible, it wasn't really 
a good, great fit, predictive maintenance in chocolate doesn't really fit. So what we thought about was to predict um, from the people who were passing our booth at the uh, um, fair, to ask them some questions, and um, based on those answers, we wanted to predict their taste in chocolate. And um, yeah, the chocolate sorts were um, those from, uh, from Ritter Sport. So yeah. <laughs> So yeah, just a little thing, step back to um, your real-time projects. What we also always happened to find uh, was this one guy in the room. There was always one person in the room who was like, uh, yeah, we already do that. Um, and that can mean a lot of things. It uh, starts from we have an Excel file and we put some regression through our data, or um, actually machine learning um, and perhaps even really good stuff. Um, yeah, so you have to take them serious. Even if they could feel like they are your enemies or stuff like that, they are not. They are actually your natural allies because they are the guys who know the data. They are the guys who want to do something with the data. So in the beginning, they could feel a little bit threatened by you that you're uh, either the new guy in the company or an external consultant, even worse. Um, but you have to win them over. And uh, actually, it's easy. And uh, because they want to do work with the data, so take them serious, ask them what are their real problems. In one case, it was basically um, not feeling sure about which direction this is going to take. Um, so take the coffee breaks. Not only in the beginning of the project, but sometimes it um, it's later in the project, take a coffee, take a one-on-one -on -one with the guy who, or the girl who's uh, feeling uncomfortable with you being there and talk about it. It's really important. It helps a lot, a lot and you get, in some cases, you even get new data you've never seen before um, because now they want to share it with you. So um, when you are going to your clients, um, they already gathered the data where, uh, which upon they want to do some data analysis. This is like the thing, how it works with, uh, with our company. But um, in this case, uh, where we wanted to do the, the uh, exhibition thing, uh, we didn't have any data. And apparently, taste um, is not really uh, good empirically uh, researched. I don't, didn't know that, but um, yeah. We didn't find any data that was really cool in this um, field. So we just asked 113 of, of our friends and um, just made up some questions, 22 questions. And um, they were all concerning taste. So it looked like that. Um, yeah, you can also um, see all the code. It's not really uh, amazing, so it's just... Um, uh, reading a CSV file. So, and then um, we just asked them uh, random questions, like how much do you like beer? How much do you like wine? And um, sauerkraut, of course, because we are in Germany. And um, yeah, also uh, your taste in music. And afterwards we asked them how much do they like um, these um, sorts of chocolate. So, um, yeah, this might have seemed quite random, and it was. <laughs> we were not sure what could come out of it, because there, we couldn't find any signs, as, you, as Natalie said already. So, um, for those of you who are real beginners with data science, um, Python and Pandas provide perfect um, tools to take a first quick look at your um, files, at your data with uh, expira um, exploration tools. And we really recommend the um, talk tomorrow by Alex about pandas indexing stuff. That's real magic. Um, so yeah, that's basically what you started um, in the beginning. Look at your data. Look what's there. And especially uh, when you're working with a client, um, tell them what you find. So um, the next point is um, it's all about visualization, um, especially like managers do like those sorts of pictures. Um, it doesn't matter to them if it does make any sense. <laughs> um, sometimes it does, um, especially if it leads to new ideas. Um, like in this case, it's, it's a correlation matrix. It's nothing um, really exciting. And um, also it goes just to the um, reddest dot is just a correlation from 0.3, so it's not really much. 
but it could lead to some um, new ideas. If you're talking with a client and you show them this correlational matrix, it could be that he sees, okay, um, yogurt, the taste in yogurt correlates a lot with tea. Um, I do have another table um, there. It's about some tea sorts. Uh, maybe we could do also um, some uh, predictions on those data or take them into our model. So it's, um, yeah, it's always about um, how to get uh, a little bit more ideas. Um, yep. <laughs> so, yeah, and we believe in iteration and that this is very important in data science um, as fast as possible. Uh, show people um, what you found, show them what you f found in the historical data even, even though you might not find it very interesting uh, or you think they should know that, they don't know it necessarily and this really is something that can provide value to them if they see how their data is actually shaped in contrast to what they believed it is like, um, that can bring new ideas and this is basically our workflow model, um, we start with exploration, uh, talk to the people, um, get to the data, build models, and in the models is basically what we knew from Kaggle. The, in this small loop, we, we do the hyperparameter tuning, we do the model selection, stuff like this, but it's actually, uh, as you can see here, the smaller part of our work, because more important is to get uh, the insights back to the experts and let them say, um, yes, it's true, or no, that doesn't make any sense at all, or oh, uh, if you're looking at that, take another table, uh, or we have someone who actually looks into that already, talk to him. Um, that provides a way faster way to iterate to, through your problem and um, build a really good model. Yeah, back to our predictive chocolate uh, thing. So um, our first idea was to do some XG boost um, because it's always nice and it worked um, really good in, the, yeah, in our experience. So the first idea was that we have to have for every single flavor one uh, model. So um, yeah, you could look at the code um, maybe later. But the nice thing about XGBoost is that it gives you some feature importances and um, one uh, pretty uh, funny thing was uh, hazelnut, the, the taste, um, yeah, the sort hazelnut. And the model says it looks um, a lot on, the, on your taste of beer and sauerkraut. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a German chocolate, I would say. So um, this, is, this is another thing. Um, it can lead to some uh, new ideas. It can lead uh, that to that the client is thinking about um, some more ideas or it's already getting some uh, meaningful um, information out of, of, out of yeah, visualizations like this. Yeah, um, so what you have to keep in mind uh, is what is your client's goal, actually. And this doesn't necessarily have to be accuracy. And especially, um, how do you define accuracy? Sometimes um, we started out now with um, the seven XG boost models to predict basically exactly how people would rank this sort of chocolate. But was it actually what we wanted from these models? Um, keep that in mind. And also the, co the complexity or how easy you can understand a model are dimensions of your client's goals that uh, influence which model you should take or which architecture of modeling you should prefer. Uh, even though deep learning is um, nice on the side of accuracy, if you have a big um, data set, it's sometimes hard to interpret. There are new methods out there to even do that right now, but those tree-based algorithms are easier to find the feature importances of. So. Um, look at what your client actually needs, what he actually wants, even though he might say at the beginning something else, he might say he wants to have the highest accuracy, ask him what this metric actually means and implement this metric, not what, he, what you thought at the beginning would be the metric. That's something to keep really in mind. Um, so yeah, for our um, project, the thing was not to have the best prediction and um, especially if we would actually do um, XG boost, that would have meant that um, we have to ask every single person that would pass our booth um, all the 22 questions, which is not um, really feasible. So our goal changed from just doing predictions to um, 
uh, do like a dimension reduction because we just wanted to ask the people the questions that are really relevant for the model to be able to predict. So what we actually did was a um, simple decision tree, which is um, yeah really on the lowest level of machine learning you can do, but still it worked for us because it was um, the right solution. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to go here. So um, yeah, that looks shitty. I'm sorry for that. Uh, this is basically our user interface for for our. Um, it's, Again, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, if you're a real beginner to data science, as we heard in the keynote today, Jupyter Notebook is great for that. Um, so what we asked persons, uh, what was also always the beginning question was, how much do you like the color black? And the person could answer something, then there would be something else, uh, German bread kind of stuff, and intensive cheese, and charts music, and then the model would make a prediction. And the uh, thing that was here very important for us was that it would be dynamically going through those questions depending on what you answered in the first question, basically. So if you didn't like the color black, uh, it would directly stop and would say you like hazelnut. And that was <laughs> astonishingly accurate. We were thinking this was a flux in the data, but actually every time someone at the, our CBIT booth uh, said, uh, I don't like the color black, he liked the hazelnut chocolate. So <laughs> we have to look further into that. Um, but uh, the nice thing here is, yeah, basically the, the kind of dimension reduction you can achieve here is dynamic. You can actually ask only the questions that are relevant. Yeah, and another uh, cool visualization you can do with G3. Um, if it's the same uh, tree, and you can see uh, if you ask the people uh, the first question, so it was black and you don't like it, then it immediately stops. If not, the question goes on and on. Yeah, and I like it because it looks so nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So visualizations are important to also understand basically your data, yeah? Um, yeah, that was the code for that. All the code is uh, later on available on GitHub. It's right now available on GitHub, but I don't have the link. Um, so let's come back to some fundamental truth of our field. Every model is wrong, but some are useful. That's true since 1976 at, at the latest. Um, everyone who is a scientist knows that we are not dealing in truth. We are dealing in statistics and um, stochastical probabilities. Um, but still, uh, statistical models are still often better than pure intuition, which is what fuels many decisions today. So what we try to provide as data scientists, and I hope all of you too, is a data-driven approach to making better decisions and not to rely only on your gut feeling. And there are a lot of places right now where there's still intuition um, and still like dashboards only dealing in the past and um, playing the blame game like you can, on, you can see on past data what went wrong but not how to prevent it. So uh, with uh, these things you also want to implement, um, we're dealing in this statistical probability that helps to make better decisions for the future. Yeah, so um, the, it's like the take-home message. It depends on the case. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sometimes it's uh, a simple decision tree that's the best solution for us. It was, and um, this is what we wanted to yeah, bring uh, out the, to the public, that um, it's, um, it's a lot about talking with the people and finding out what their goal is and try to find the best solution for that. Yeah, so if you are interested, we are... Um, here we will stand, I think, uh, in front of the door and uh, with our laptops and you can try this uh, really simple model by yourself. And yeah, just some end notes. Um, things that we liked a lot, um, some uh, cool homepages. Um, analytics video is a cool blog thing. Um, Kaggle kernels, linear digressions is a podcast. Um, it's just, yeah, if you are interested, it's what we um, listened and um, read a lot, so we liked it. And yeah, if you want to be a part of this uh, predictive chocolate uh, <laughs> project, then you can uh, go in this um, link and get your data in and uh, help us <laughs> uh, with this uh, project. Yeah, so we are really excited to um, hear your questions now.
Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question, maybe I missed it, but how did you create the decision tree? Oh yeah, the, so that's um, simply from sklearn, so scikit-learn. Um, it's a, the um, code is, I think, yeah, in this direction, I see it. Um, it's quite simple. <laughs> uh, it's basically this line of code. So um, what we can also um, really recommend is all the tools out there. Um, the best algorithms are there as open source packages. So scikit-learn has an implementation of decision tree um, regression, for regression tools. Thank you for the talk, it was very interesting. Um, I kind of didn't get the part that, you know, you were talking about customers not knowing what they want. Um, how do you deal with that? Because I have that in now, right now. <laughs> I mean, they know there's something wrong with what they are doing, and they have a lot of data, but they don't know what exactly, you know? Yeah. They're just giving me their data, and they're telling yeah. me, okay, do something for yeah. us. <laughs> Fix it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, this is the thing. You try, and we try to um, be like the, the main organizer of the thing. So we try to tell them, yeah, you have to get a meeting together. We have to talk with the people who are actually dealing with the data, who are doing like database stuff. So they um, have some sometimes like a gut feeling for how the, how they think um, the data is connected with each other or some r relationships where they have some assumptions um, on. And um, yeah, we try to get all the people together. Um, at first we try to get uh, like an open space where everybody can say all the craziest idea and all the craziest assumptions they have and then try to focus on one thing. We we um, do that just um, in a few hours, like the agenda was just a few hours, and at the end we say, okay, let's focus on just one thing, and then we will try that, and then we will see if it works or not. And this is the iteration thing. So, yeah, basically, like that. does this answer your question or not really? <laughs> it kind, it kind yeah. of does. I mean, at the end it comes uh, down to the people who are working on the you know, actual project, not the data scientists. I mean, if you have good people on the on the side, mm. even if they don't know at the beginning, mm. then maybe with your guidance they can get get there and they can yeah. find out. But if this is missing, then I think yeah. this is kind of a piece of the puzzle that you need actually to do a data science science project. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that that's basically why we wanted to give this talk to get this over because. In the beginning, we thought we could start only as data scientists, but mm -hmm. now we realized we have to talk to them again and again and again and show them what we thought they wanted. Or, um, and then they, at some point, hopefully realize what they actually wanted. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? Uh, I, I have a quick one. Um, what kind of billing model do you guys use? Do you bill for the workshops? If you're like exploring an idea, do you build them for the exploration period? Is it like per hour consulting, per project? Sorry? What kind of billing model you use? Billing, oh yeah, it's consulting. Okay, cool. So it's per hour, basically. Yeah. Cool. yeah? I can keep going. Anyone got more questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have like another minute or two. Hi, and thanks again for the talk. Um, I have a comment or end a question. Uh, don't you feel like you're consultants and you should know that. Um, is it that management tends to see data science as a buzzword thing right now and a go-to solution for everything that they can come up with in data? Because I have the very strong feeling that there is, like, there is, there is a danger if we as data analysts and data scientists don't really watch out that we will dilute the border between bullshit and real insight. Of course, <laughs> completely correct. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's always the problem with these buzzwords. Um, but uh, you can use a buzzword also to get basically, data science can also, it starts with data analysis. The management doesn't need to realize that, that they pay us in the beginning for simple data analysis. 
but it's actually where, where the most of our, our value comes from, <laughs> that someone looks at the data. So you're right, um, generating insights is sometimes not data science per se, but more data analysis, um, which you can't sell that good. <laughs> so yes, um, the, the difficulties are definitely there. That, and of course, data science is also at some points even burned already, because some people um, sold incredibly promises. So you have companies who tell you like, yeah, okay, there were those big companies in 2012 who told us they could get everything out of it and we blew a million dollars out of the window and now we don't believe in it. Cool. Uh, let's thank our speakers again.